Hello everyone and welcome to this Griffith University Alumni Networking um, webinar. Thank you for joining us from your various locations around the world. Countries are far field as China, France, Singapore, Vietnam, Pakistan, as well as all over Australia. My name is Jenny Longrig and I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at Griffith University. I'd like to start today by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which those of us in Australia are respectively located. Pay my respects to those um, elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. For many of you, this one may be your first Griffith alumni event, as we've got many of our soon to be and also our recent graduates joining us today. May I extend on behalf of the whole alumni team my heartfelt congratulations on this milestone that you've achieved in graduating. We know the hard work and dedication that would have gone into your time studying and we wish you all the best for your career ahead. I'd like to remind you that whilst you've now graduated, the doors to Griffith are still open and always will be and we're delighted to have you now part of the alumni community. Griffith University has over 200,000 alumni in over 140 countries around the globe and keeping in touch and providing alumni engagement activities to you all can be challenging, especially in the current COVID-19 climate. So being able to deliver events online like today's webinar provides the opportunity to connect with so many more of our alumni than, other, than, than might otherwise be possible. We do greatly value our relationships with our alumni and we love to stay in touch. And that's why this year we're doing a major reconnect campaign to find those alumni that we may have lost touch with and also to enrich the information we know about those we are connected to. And so we can offer targeted communications and activities for everyone. Your assistance with updating your own information and encouraging those who we may have lost touch with, but you might still know of, to update theirs would be appreciated. I'm sure the COVID-19 pandemic has been impacting many of you, and we of course wish you all the very best as we all navigate through this. Through a collective effort, the graduating class are invited to leave their mark on Griffith University and to take the first steps forward to become the proud Griffith alumni and budding philanthropists. Financial contributions go towards funding a scholarship for exceptionally talented students experiencing financial hardship. All of these funds are raised that are, uh, all these funds that are raised are then matched by the university dollar for dollar and are attributed to being part of the graduating class gift. Before I introduce you to our speaker, a little webinar housekeeping. A tip sheet on how to participate in today's session was emailed to you. However, just a reminder that you can ask questions about the content at any time in the Q&A panel on your screen. I'd also like to advise you that this session is being recorded and some of the content may be shared at a later date. If you'd like to post a question, but you'd like not to be personally identified, you can tick the anonymous button at the bottom of your question panel. We encourage the discussions to continue after today's session. So please share any key learnings from today using the hashtag Griffith Alumni on your social platforms such as Facebook and Instagram. Now, I am delighted to introduce you to our guest presenter, Emma Edwards. Emma is a double degree graduate of Griffith University and also the founder and managing director of Edwards HR. Emma's career spans many heavy, vehicle, um, heavy industries, including mining, construction materials, manufacturing, transport, warehousing and supply chain across areas of operational and strategic human resources. She holds a Bachelor of Business in Human Resources and a Bachelor of Psychological Science, along with a breadth of unrivaled industry experience with some of Australia's largest and also smallest businesses. Emma has kindly offered to join us today to talk about the recruitment process from an employer's perspective and to share some practical tips and advice which you can implement right away to land that job you've always wanted. Thank you, Emma. Thanks very much, Jenny. I'm very excited to be here today and thank you to everyone who's decided to dial in as well. Um, I'd like to start by firstly saying congratulations to everybody. It's um, quite an achievement to make it to graduation, but it's also a bit nerve wracking when it comes to trying to find your first graduate role as well. So 
um, I guess today I'd like to um, have a chat with you about a lot of the things that I wish I had have known as a graduate when I was looking for work. Um, Jenny sort of did an introduction about me, so I probably won't go into too much detail about myself, but to give you a bit of background, um, I have quite a unique background. Um, you don't come across many HR professionals who have the heavy industry experience that I have, and Edwards HR is actually the first and only heavy industry HR specialist in Australia. Um, and if it weren't for my time at Griffith, I wouldn't be here talking to you today about the successful business that I have um, and sharing the experiences that I have with you. So thanks very much to the team at Griffith as well. Um, I graduated back in 2011 and I've uh, obviously been in, in HR since then. Um, and I guess what would have been useful for me when I was a graduate was understanding uh, the perspective of the employer um, when you go to interviews and you do job applications and understanding why is it that I need to tailor my cover letter to each job that I apply for and you know that's frustrating because it's time consuming and um, you know all of those kinds of things so they're the types of things that I'd like to share with you today so we'll start with what do employers look for and, and where to find work I want to have a chat with you about um, resumes cover letters video applications and a few other things that go into putting together a good application and how you can stand out uh, the impact of your social media profiles because you'll be very surprised just how much impact they actually do have. Um, recruitment from the employer's perspective, like I mentioned, and some of those interview skills and uh, a Q&A session at the end. And obviously, um, you're welcome to post questions throughout the session and I'll try and answer those if I can. Um, if not, I'll, I'll come to those towards the end. So the number one question that I get asked when I speak with graduates and students is what are employers looking for? Now, there is no one size fits all answer to that question, unfortunately, and that's because every employer is different. Every business is different. Every manager who's going through the recruitment process, they're looking for different things. Um, and at the end of the day, every role is different too. So to kind of get an understanding of what employers are looking for when you're looking for work, the best place to start is the ad that you're looking at. Um, usually employers will have an ad on Seek or some kind of platform that you're looking at that tells you that they've got a vacancy. Um, their number one goal is to fill that vacancy. The ad itself, while it might just look like a list of responsibilities and, you know, some personality traits, that actually, it actually tells you exactly what they're looking for. So those responsibilities are um, what the job's going to entail. Usually it will also tell you the location and the hours and, and those kinds of things too. But the list of qualifications, experience and personality traits, um, I would very much use that as a roadmap uh, to work out what it is that that employer is looking for so that you can tailor your resume and your cover letter to that. Um, and those items will also likely guide the interview questions if you make it to interview as well. Um, you know, if, if they're saying in an ad that they are looking for attention to detail and good teamwork and good communication skills, um, there's, there's no doubt you'll probably be asked about those in an interview as well. Um, I guess the other thing to just point out is, um, unfortunately, there's usually only one role when an employer is advertising for a vacancy. So your number one goal um, should be to stand out in that pile of applications so that you can land an interview. And that's where we'll talk about that in, in a moment. Um, more broadly, when it comes to what employers are looking for in graduates and students, um, these are a few of the key things. So cultural fit, it's about making sure that the person that they hire matches um, the business's values and goals and the types of services and products that they offer. Um, obviously, they, you know, everyone in the team needs to get along, so fitting in with other personalities and, and things that are already in the business. Um, communication skills are obviously very important. Without communication, um, <laughs> we don't have people, we don't have so um, that one's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, drive, commitment and the desire to, I guess, continually better yourself. Um, as a, a graduate, um, you've got a, a whole range of skills and experience, but um, the one thing that you might be missing is the practical application of all of those things in the workplace. Um, so, you know, employers are looking for people who do want to keep learning and keep bettering themselves and in turn that betters those businesses and um, there's lots of flow on effects I guess. Uh, teamwork, so as a graduate 
um, most of the things that you do will involve teamwork. Uh, that's that's how you learn, I guess. So uh, it kind of makes sense that that's what employers are looking for. And I guess the final thing that I'd like to point out is that um, GPA is very important. Um, academically, GPA is it, it's important for many reasons. Um, but when it comes to looking for a job, it's not everything to every industry. So um, in health, engineering, law, those kinds of industries, um, GPA is certainly very important when employers are looking at potential applicants. In my case, um, I, oh, I, I couldn't count how many interviews I went to and how many jobs I applied for, but um, I didn't have my GPA on my resume and I don't remember being asked about it once. So, well, I mean, I don't have anything to hide when it comes to my GPA, I was quite proud of it, but the point is, um, you know, don't, don't let that be of concern to you if it's not where you'd like it to be. <clears throat> so where to look? When um, I was at uni, I found that most of the people I studied with only wanted to get into a graduate program. That was their goal. Um, graduate programs are often offered by very large companies and, you know, traditionally they would have big cohorts where they might let a certain number of graduates in across different disciplines at various times throughout the year. Um, but reality is that only two to three percent of graduates will actually find their first role in a graduate program like that. Um, also, to put that into context, um, across all of those employers around Australia, let's say there might be 200 graduate program positions in all of Australia, not even just Brisbane, but all of Australia. Um, compare that to the tens of thousands of graduates that we have every year. That means that we need to look at other places to find work. So um, what I recommend is don't limit yourself to just looking for vacancy, looking at entry level roles and positions that might have the title officer or assistant. Um, they're often really good ways to get your foot in the door of companies that you'd like to work for. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit like when an apprentice starts work, they very much have to um, start at the bottom, learn the ropes, learn how the business does things and the best ways to do things. And um, I guess that's sort of where you're at as well. So it kind of makes sense to start in one of those entry level type positions so that you can um, eventually progress through the ranks. Um, if it's possible to find an internship or some kind of placement or volunteer work, that can absolutely help as well. Um, finding work experience of any kind, whether it, ideally you'd like for it to be paid in most cases, but even if it's not, uh, any experience is better than no experience. Um, the other thing is a lot of people are looking for full-time work when they graduate and that makes sense, um, but sometimes you might be able to find casual or part-time work. Um, that's particularly the case at the moment with COVID. Understandably, not all businesses are able to employ people full-time at the moment, so they're looking at um, you know, short term engagements or having people on a casual basis. I, I would just recommend that you're sort of open to all of those things rather than absolutely setting your heart on um, one job in, in one employer. Just keep an open mind. Um, so that's a little bit about the sort of jobs that you can look for. But the next thing is, where do you find those? So you'll see that the first three items on this list are all online platforms. Um, these are all the most common platforms that people will look for. Seek is obviously the number one employment website in Australia. Um, LinkedIn and Graduate Connection are um, not too far behind. Seek's also got a graduate website. Um, they've also got a volunteer version of their website too that, you know, you can, a quick Google, Google search and you'll find lots of, lots of job search engines. Um, and all of those will have different jobs listed and obviously company websites will have things listed as well. Um, if there's any any employers in particular that you like the look of that you'd like to work for, I would very much recommend that you keep an eye on their website or even submit an expression of interest if you can. Um, and as you probably know, the Griffith platform has lots of different uh, graduate and entry level roles all throughout the year as well. You'll see that the next part of this list is actually all about relationships. Um, my business and my career has all been built on the relationships that I have with people. Um, you would be amazed the type of opportunities that might present themselves just by talking to your family and your friends and your neighbours about 
what you've studied and what you'd like to do as the first step in your career. Um, same with your current employer. So I worked at Proud's The Jewelers for about four years when I was at uni and not long before I graduated, um, they were actually renegotiating their enterprise agreement. Now, at the, at the time, I had no idea what that actually meant. I just knew that it was something HR related. So I phoned the HR advisor in Sydney who was looking after the entire process and I just said, hey, I'm Emma, I'm about to graduate, I've got a double degree in this and I'd love to be involved if I can because I knew that that would be just a little bit of experience to give me a bit of a taste of, of HR and what that meant. Um, and I was able to do that. I, I was able to be involved in the process and um, I literally just asked a question of the right person and um, got exposure to something that I otherwise would, would not have even been involved with. Um, networking and events as well. So keep in touch with the people that you've studied with. Keep in touch with the alumni groups, um, professional associations in your industry. There's probably one, whether you, you realise it or not. Um, go to their networking events. The, the, pe the relationships that you have with people are, are very important. And um, yeah, for, for me personally, they've opened lots of doors and there's been plenty of opportunities just by asking questions of the right people. Um, so I'm going to go into some of the things in, in detail, but uh, just broadly to begin with, I would strongly recommend you keep an open mind. So I, I spoke earlier about role types, um, but I'd also be open to different industries. It's very easy to set your heart on, you know, I want to go into transport and logistics or I'd have to go to this particular hospital or, you know, um, sometimes as a graduate, you just have to realise that there's not as many jobs as there are graduates and, you um, you know, you need to be flexible in <laughs> the type of work that you're looking for. So just keep an open mind in general. Um, with pay rates as well, uh, I'll talk a little bit about that um, when I talk about the application process, but I guess it's a good idea for you to know what the graduate rate is for the type of work that you're looking for, but don't, don't go overboard on that. <laughs> if you're asked, um, if you know that the graduate salary for the type of role that you're looking for is, I don't know, let's say it's fifty five or sixty thousand dollars a year, don't go telling employers that you're looking for eighty thousand. Um, you know, when it's unrealistic like that, um, it, it's probably not going to do you any favours. In general, I'd strongly recommend being approachable and professional and always getting back to people. So if you've applied for work and you've um, missed a call from someone because you were in a meeting or you were in a, a lecture or whatever it is, always give them a call back. Um, just give people the courtesy that they've given you. Um, use your resume and your cover letter to demonstrate how you're aligned with the particular business that you're applying for work for. I'll come to that in more detail shortly. Um, and take the time to make adjustments to your application documents so that you can set yourself um, at the top of that application pile. If there are any directions provided in an ad, some, some of these directions might be specifically that you must include a cover letter or that you might not have to. Um, they might ask you to uh, attach your academic transcript. There might be selection criteria that needs to, to be addressed. A lot of the time there are no directions, but if there are, absolutely make sure that you follow them. Um, and as I said before, have a chat with people that you know about your interests and your opportunities. I guess the good news is, like it says, most graduates find work within four months of graduation. That's what research tells us in Australia. All right, so the goal of your resume is you make the application using your resume and the next step is you want to land an interview. So what are my tips? I can actually so keep it clean and simple. Clean and simple is professional. If we start using bright colours and fancy text and all those types of things, um, it actually doesn't look professional anymore. Um, it's easiest to just keep it all clean and simple. Um, you'll see on the, the don't list there, there is a an exception to that. And I guess that's unless it's for portfolio or, or creative type work. Um, on your resume, list your responsibilities, but also include any accomplishments. So if you've worked in retail and uh, you've been part of a team who has smashed their sales budgets once or regularly, include that in your resume. That's a way for you to prove um, that you've 
interested in going above and beyond and you're achieving things. Likewise, if you've got accolades or awards or anything from university or sports or those types of things, um, that goes a long way to, to supporting your application. So just make sure you include those types of things. Use a professional email address. Uh, you'd be surprised how many times I've seen sexy this and surfer dude that and, you know, applications that are not necessarily professional. Um, it's not always easy to get an email address that is first name and last name because obviously there's millions of people who are trying to get the same email address. But if it's possible to have um, first name, last name or initials, you know, something basic that's just about you rather than other random words, try and do that. Spell check and grammar check and double check and triple check those, those items. You would also be amazed how many times I see resumes and cover letters that say, I've got brilliant attention to detail. And then in the same document, we've got spelling mistakes and stuff. Um, something that people seem to not really pay enough attention to is the fact that if you're applying for a job, you want the person reading your resume to know your name and they, they want to know your contact details as well. So make sure, don't put them at the end of the page or the end of the document. We want to put them at the top, um, you know, right in front of their nose so that they know whose resume they're looking at and how to contact you. That's your phone number and your email address as well. So in terms of some of the things not to do, I mentioned about bright colours and fancy text. Um, photos, images and emojis and stuff, don't use those unless they're specifically requested. Um, it, they're literally just, just not needed as part of the application process. This one's a no-brainer, but don't lie or bend the truth. You'll probably find that your contract of employment has a clause in it that says um, during the application process you were meant to be truthful. So <laughs> make sure that you are. Um, don't include salary expectations um, or any other personal information for that matter. Uh, the employer doesn't need to know uh, how old you are or how what religion you are, whether you're married or not, whether you've got kids or not, all that kind of personal information. It just doesn't need to be on there. Um, and then I guess just a final point is for a graduate who doesn't have a lot of experience, um, keep it to two pages max. Just keep it simple. So the goal of your cover letter is to supplement and add to um, by that, I guess your resume is a, a list of skills and experiences and work history and all that kind of basic stuff. But your cover letter is an opportunity to actually use some words to, in, in paragraphs to actually explain who you are and, and what you're looking for. So um, I would introduce yourself. I would explain why you're interested in the role or the company. So to give you an idea, um, my first role was at Wagner's. Uh, Wagner's is a Toowoomba based company that does all kinds of mining, construction materials, transport, all that type of stuff. And um, quite naturally, I've landed in this type of industry because it's what I've always been around. So I in, literally in my cover letter for Wagner's when I applied for the role, um, I explained that I was the daughter of a diesel fitter and the wife of a diesel fitter. And I've been around those industries forever and a day. It's what I've grown up with. Um, and for me, I was able to demonstrate, by saying that, I was able to demonstrate um, my understanding of the industry and, you know, some of the knowledge that I could bring. Um, it's important to, I guess, tailor your cover letter in that kind of way so that you stand out. Um, it is very time consuming to do that, but I've, I've seen it done very successfully. Um, and like I said, that's literally just talking about you. Introduce yourself by saying this is who I am and this is what I've studied and I've recently graduated and then go into some detail about why it is that you're interested in, in the company in particular and talk about what, if anything what you know about the industry and any transferable skills that you have. I'll come back to transferable skills shortly as well. Um, keep it brief, no more than a page and the employer will use the cover letter that you provide to have a look at your communication style, so how you explain things and introduce yourself. They'll look at your attention to detail um, and how the points you raise are relevant to their business and for the job that they're trying to recruit for. All right, so I said I'd come to social media pages. This is also one of the, this is probably the second thing I get asked about the most. Um, so Career Builder is the US version of Seek. Um, back in 2017, they interviewed a whole heap of HR people and hiring managers. 
and they found a whole heap of statistics which are probably useful for you <laughs> when you're going through this application process. So I know you can read yourself, but seven in 10 employers will check a candidate's social media presence as part of the hiring process. And might I point out, that's usually when they get your resume before an interview. So I'll talk about tidying up social media profiles shortly, but I would strongly recommend that you have a look at um, the concerns that the employers have raised on this slide and make sure that none of these things are on your social media profile because they could potentially stop you from even getting an interview. Um, the last so the, sorry, the last um, statistic there for me is probably the one that's most concerning. 54% found content on social media that caused them not to hire a candidate. So the pie graph over to the right shows you the time um, content that they've found. So inappropriate videos, photos and information, information about drinking and drug use and information linked to criminal behaviour. They're the top three. So you might be surprised that people actually have that kind of stuff on their social media profiles, but believe me, they do. Um, there's obviously a, a few others there, uh, but one that I'd just like to point out in particular is sharing confidential information from a previous employer. And also um, another one that sort of ties into that is bad mouthing a previous employer. I know you feel like you can say whatever you like on social media, but when you're looking for work, just play it safe. If you think that there is any risk of um, what you're about to say or share jeopardising your chances of getting a job, go with your gut and probably don't post it. It's not all bad though. Um, the good news is that more than 44% of these businesses have found content on social media that did lead them to hire someone. Um, so these are all the kinds of things that you, I mean, if you like, completely put your profile to private. Um, but if you if you do want to have the things that employer, employers want to see, so qualifications, creativity, um, just generally showing a professional image, um, good fit with company culture, good communication style, you know, they're all the types of things that I mentioned you would include on, on your resume as well. Um, I guess it's just about trying to have your social media profiles mirror the image that you're trying to portray to the businesses that you're applying for work to. I should also point out these stats are actually from 2017. So I would see, I would expect to see an increase in these numbers if anything. Um, employers that I deal with, I recommend that they check social media profiles when they recruit if they're not already, and most of them, them already are. So like I said, it's it's probably just best to play it safe and go with your gut when you're putting stuff online. So still talking about the application process, um, COVID-19 and I guess just an increase in use in technology in general, um, we've seen a very big increase in video applications. So that's um, literally recording yourself and submitting that as an application. Sometimes it's with a resume and, and sometimes it's not. I guess the point of doing that is um, the employer gets to see you and how you speak and what your personality is like and all those kinds of things before meeting with you. Um, it sort of streamlines their process a little bit because it cuts out a whole heap of reading resumes and making phone calls and all those kinds of things, but it also helps um, various people in the recruitment process who might not necessarily be based in the same office. So if they're working from home or they're in different locations, um, they can all see the video application. <clears throat> Excuse me for a second. If you're asked to submit a video application, um, there's a few points here that I would recommend. <coughs> I'm so sorry. Address exactly what they're looking for. So usually they'll give you a list of what they'd like included in your application. Make sure you follow it. Keep it short and sharp. And just remember, you want to get their attention early on. So when you're scrolling through Facebook and TikTok and whatever, if you're watching a video, you will only keep watching it if it gets your attention in the first couple of seconds. It's the same for them. You want them to get your attention right away. Be yourself and let your personality shine through because at the end of the day, that's actually why they're asking for a video application. They want to see your personality. 
wear something comfortable and that makes you feel confident. There's no point in wearing something like uncomfortable with because that actually shows when in your body language when when that video is recorded. As awkward as it might be, try and look at the camera. Um, you know, it, it's a bit like making eye contact when the person's actually in front of you, but <laughs> you're just doing it with a camera instead. Um, if possible, record somewhere quiet and with good lighting. So it's not, it doesn't always have to be in a, a kitchen or a, a bedroom or an office or whatever. Sometimes it's OK to do it outside, um, but just make it professional. Um, and professional equipment is not needed. So despite that photo, you don't need a fancy camera or video recorder of any kind. Smartphones are just fine these days. If you've got a tripod or someone to hold it, that'll get you through. All right, so interview preparation. Um, interview preparation can go a very long way, not only for you delivering answers to questions really well, but also handling your nerves. Um, when you're prepared, you're a whole lot less likely to, to be worried about what you're saying and am, am I going to be late and all those things that cause stress. So before an interview, always research the employer. So find out what they do, what are the services and products that they offer, what are their values, and think about what you have to offer that business. Um, when I do interviews, I will always ask, what do you know about us or why do you want to work here? And if you don't know what the business does and their values and things, you can't answer those questions very well. So always have a look at, at the employer and what they do. Read the ad and read it again and again and familiarise yourself with the responsibilities and what that employer is looking for. Because as I mentioned earlier, you'll probably be asked some questions about the points that they've raised in the ad. Practice interview questions. So you will probably in just about every interview be asked about your past jobs and what you did in those jobs, um, what you liked or didn't like or what you found difficult and also why you left. Um, have a think about the answers to those questions and be ready to, to talk about that. Um, Examples of transferable skills you will also pretty much be asked about in just about in every interview you go to. So transferable skills are skills that you've learnt at uni, for example, that you can apply in the workplace, even though you don't necessarily have experience in that workplace just yet. So you might think, oh, but I'm just a barista and I just make coffee and, you know, well, sorry, but you're not just a barista. You're probably someone who is very skilled at handling very stressful situations with people unhappy about their coffee being too hot or too cold or taking too long or whatever. So when you're asked about being put on the spot and juggling unhappy customers with time pressure and all that kind of stuff, you actually have a transferable skill that you can talk about. Um, and doesn't matter where that skills come from. It could be from the casual or the part time employment that you have as a student, or it might be from um, whatever association you have with a sporting club, whether you're a coach or an umpire, or you might have, you know, a church or a community group that you deal with. You've probably got plenty of examples in those places that you can actually apply to the workplace. Um, and it's not until someone points them out to you that you realise that they're actually there. Um, another one that you might commonly be asked is why should we hire you? And that's about having a, a very brief elevator pitch about what you can offer the job. And I would always tie that back into your values and the company's values um, and sort of pointing out how they align. Um, in terms of travel, one of the most stressful things can be knowing that I need to be there at least 10 minutes early but I'm stuck in traffic and I don't have the phone number and I don't know who to call and I'm going to be late. And that's something that you want to avoid. So always check your travel stuff beforehand. So if you're traveling by bus or train, check those timetables and make sure that you're arriving with sufficient time to be able to then walk to the office or the location that you're going to. And if you're traveling by car, um, do the same thing. So know how long it takes to get there that type of day. You can do those searches in Google. Um, and always know where you're going to park as well. If it's street parking, allow plenty of time for you to find a park. Um, I would also recommend presenting for the interview five to ten minutes early. So you don't want to be so late that you arrive right on time or you're late because obviously that leaves quite a bad impression. 
But if you arrive too early, that can actually not work in your favour sometimes as well, because the person who's interviewing you might feel like they're being interrupted. They've, you know, you've come super early and they feel like they need to attend to you now when they're actually in the middle of something. And, you know, it's them trying to juggle their own workload as well. So five to 10 minutes before your scheduled interview time is, is definitely ideal. The other one that causes a lot of stress, which usually leads to people being late, is outfit. So we want to wear something that we're comfortable in, that we feel confident in. And all I'll say on that is make sure you organise it the day before if you can, so that you're comfortable with what you're wearing. If not, do it early in the morning so that you've got it out of the way and you're ready to go when you need to. So in terms, just some other points in terms of handling nerves. Um, the, the previous slide was all about preparation. Hopefully, if we've gone through all those preparation tips before the interview, your nerves should be at bay. But if they're not, <laughs> keep practicing those interview questions. So just a, a couple more points on those, those practice questions. Um, I found it useful to write down my answers in, in dot form and read them out loud might sound stupid and it might feel silly doing it, but you gain confidence because you are confident in what you're saying and you know what you're trying to tell the other person because you're practicing. And then by also doing it with friends and family, if you want to, um, you can ask for feedback on their responses and anything that you can do better. And that outsider's perspective can be quite useful as well. This is a really simple one, but maintaining good posture. So literally, sitting up or standing up straight, having your shoulders back. I can see people on the call doing this as I speak. <laughs> um, it can actually make you feel a whole lot happier. You have energy and it makes you confident. And that comes across in, in the way that you project your voice as well. Um, take a deep breath, give yourself a moment to think, and that can stop you from rambling and talking really fast. Sometimes you get an in interview question and you don't actually know what to say. And it is okay to stop and breathe and just think about what you're going to say. Um, of course, if you've got something to say, say it, but don't feel like you can't just stop and think about it because you can. Bring a bottle of water. Um, often there'll be a, a glass and, and water on the table anyway, but bring your own just in case. And just remember that no one is perfect and mistakes happen. And you're probably going to go to several interviews before you find the role that, that gets offered to you. Um, but learn from, from those first ones. Um, you'll think about the interview after you've been there and there'll be things that you think, oh, I wish I had have said this or I should have done that or I shouldn't have folded my arm. Whatever it is, there'll be lots of things that you think about afterwards. Just remember them for next time and eventually you'll get there. So personal presentation. This is a lot more than just what you wear. Um, and this does vary between industries and the type of jobs that you're looking for as well. Um, so just a few points. Obviously, clean clothes and shoes are a given. Um, neat presentation and grooming is just about um, don't go overkill with makeup and jewellery and perfume and <laughs> all those kinds of things. Just keep it simple. Same as everything you've done so far. Simple resume, <laughs> simple personal presentation when you go as well. Um, being confident, smiling and making eye contact will go a really long way. And it's OK if you're nervous and you stumble over your words and um, you look to the corner of the room because you're thinking all those types of things are fine. The interviewer will know that you're nervous. Um, but just try and keep yourself composed, <laughs> breathe and smile. Being friendly and polite also goes a really, really long way. When you come in for the interview, always greet people, say hello, say thank you, thanks for having me. Um, all those simple things say a lot about your character. Um, remember those social media, sorry, I'm stumbling over my own words here. Remember those social media profiles. All of that ties into your personal presentation as well. And we know that we would like you to portray the right image to the employers that you're trying to get work with. Um, and wouldn't usually say this, but because of COVID-19 at the moment, refrain from shaking hands. If you go into a place for an interview and they need you to use hand sanitizer or wear a mask or whatever it may be, 
um, that is their way of upholding their health and safety obligations in their business. So just make sure you comply with that type of stuff as well. Um, if in doubt, think about the employer that you want to work for and dress up rather than down. It's very unlikely that you're going to need a suit and tie, but don't go in in you know, jeans and thongs. <laughs> Let's go for something professional in the middle. So video interviews, a bit like what I was saying earlier about video applications, because of COVID-19, we've seen a shift and there's lots of video applications, uh, sorry, video interviews these days, rather than getting people in for face-to-face -face interviews. So yes, people are still doing face-to-face -face interviews, but you're more likely these days to, to be invited to a video interview as part of the recruitment process as well. So I would always prepare in the same way for a face, sorry, for a video interview, prepare in the same way as you would for a face-to-face -face interview. That's all the stuff about handling nerves and practicing interview questions and breathing and um, having water ready. All those kinds of things apply to a video interview as well. But there's a few extra things to do because we're dealing with technology. So do a test run. Make sure that your webcam works, your microphone works, um, your internet's not going to cut out. And if you know that it's going to cut out, go somewhere else. Go into Griffith. Go to, I was going to say a cafe, but that might not actually be appropriate. You know, find somewhere where you've got a good internet um, and make sure your lighting's all right as well. Um, use headphones if need be. You'll probably see I've actually got headphones in at the moment and that's because in my office, um, it's you can probably hear me better if I wear my headphones. Don't be concerned about those. Uh, maintain eye contact, so try and look at the camera as much as you can. It's really weird. I can tell you now I'm trying to do it myself and it's very different to <laughs> standing in front of someone, um, but try and look at the camera in an interview, uh, a video interview that is. Keep your resume close by just in case you need it and dress appropriately. So over to the right, we'll see these guys who have been in Zoom meetings every day and because they're sitting at their desks and people can only see them from the chest up, they're not wearing any pants but I wouldn't recommend doing that in an interview <laughs> if there is any chance that you need to get up because someone's interrupted you, you need to grab water, you need to grab anything, you don't want to risk the employer seeing that. <laughs> um, so just a couple of other things to not forget about. So always plug in your charger. You obviously don't want your laptop or your phone or whatever to run out when you're partway through an interview. <clears throat> Put your phone on silent so that that can't interrupt you. Use a neutral background. Um, ideally, it doesn't really matter whether it's your bedroom or your lounge room or a kitchen or whatever. Just try and tidy things up a bit. Have water, pen and paper nearby in case you need them. Um, have the employer's phone number so that if you do lose your internet connection or your laptop dies or whatever, you can actually contact them. Be sure to apologise if someone interrupts you or enters the room. And mute your microphone if there's unavoidable background noise. Sometimes you just can't help that the rubbish truck is going by or there's a house being built next door. All those kinds of things that cause lots of noise, they're all fine. But if it's possible to just make it easier for the other person on the other end of the line, just mute your microphone. So I just wanted to touch on uh, a few other recruitment techniques that companies use that I sometimes get asked about. So. You'll, for anyone who's applied for a job on Seek before, you've probably seen that there's application screening questions. Often they are, how many years experience do you have? Do you have the right to work in Australia? Um, they might ask you about your salary expectations, those types of things. Um, always just answer those truthfully. With the remuneration stuff, as I said earlier, don't overshoot that. Don't say you're looking for 80K if you know that the graduate salary for your industry is 60. Um, in terms of the questions about your right to work in Australia, the reason that that gets asked is because employers have the obligation to check that their employees have the right to work in Australia. That means that either they're an Australian citizen or they have an appropriate visa to be here. That's, that's why that question gets asked. Um, sometimes employers will do a phone interview. So usually if they call you out of the blue, they're probably going to ask you some basic questions just about your background and what you're looking for. And it's really just to get an idea of what your personality is like before they organise to get you in for an interview, if they want to do that. And it can take you off guard. Um, I've made calls like that myself and some people 
you just completely catch them off guard and they stumble over their words and they don't know what to say. All those things are okay. Um, if it's absolutely not a convenient time because you're, a, I don't know, you're about to go into an interview or you're in a wedding or, you know, you're somewhere, you might be at work, whatever it is, um, just let them know that it's not a good time and can you give them a call back. Don't, don't feel like you can't ask for them to give you a call back. Um, the other thing I just remember uh, on, on your end, I would encourage you to remember the jobs that you've applied for. Because from the employer's perspective, there's nothing worse than calling someone about a job that they've applied for, but they have no idea what you're actually calling about. Um, and it can be hard to keep track of, you know, all of the, the jobs that you've applied for. But uh, if it is possible to try and remember some of those things so you don't get completely caught off guard when you get that phone call, um, that can sort of help your position in the recruitment process. Sorry, I'm just reading some questions here. I'm going to answer those at the end. Um, most graduates will be asked behavioural interviews at some point. What those employers are looking for, so a, an example of a behavioural question is, tell me about a time when you have had to work as part of a team or give me an example of a time that you've coped well under pressure. Those types of things where what they're asking you about is how you handle situations and what transferable skills you have. And they ask you those because whatever they're asking about, it's likely to happen in that workplace. So what usually they will tell you that they would like you to answer in a star response. They might give you an, another one, they'll usually tell you. But what they wanna know is, what was the situation? So the situation was, um, I had to deliver a group uni assignment and be the person who was responsible for putting the presentation together. My task was I had to work with the team and put the slides together, make sure that everyone knew what they were talking about, you know, itemise what it is that you were actually responsible for personally then talk about what action you took. So I literally started a presentation from scratch. I populated all the content. I organised meetings with people to make sure that everyone knew what they were talking about and then talk about the, res the response or the result. Um, that's we ended up presenting in the tutorial on time. Everything went well or maybe it didn't. Um, you know, it, it's just about talking in a, a logical sequence about what you've done, but it's important to talk about what you have done rather than what the group did because that's what the employer is looking for so it's really good to talk in the context of we like we did this we did that or we were successful or we achieved these results um, because obviously that shows that you work well as part of a team but when they ask behavioral questions they are specifically asking about you and what you did um, and I mentioned earlier that when it comes to transferable skills and talking about those kinds of situations, if you don't have a work example to use, it doesn't matter. Use something from uni or your sports or your community groups, whatever it is, you've, you've probably got an example somewhere. And the other thing that is commonly used mainly in government roles, but sometimes in, in other businesses as well, is selection criteria. So selection criteria is usually a set of specific criteria that they want you to answer, um, usually in a written form as part of your application. And think of that as an assignment. So on their end, they've got, I don't know, it might be five or six different criteria that they've got to weigh all the applicants up against. So they're asking you to address that criteria. So when they receive your responses, they're probably going to use a weighting system of some kind. Uh, so that they can, I guess, measure candidates against each other. So it's hard for me to sort of give too much guidance around that because the things that they ask are very different depending on the type of job and the type of industry that it's in. But I would always just follow any instructions that they've given. And if you're not sure how to answer something, use the STAR response. So what I spoke about with behavioural interviews, that's explaining the situation, the task, the action that you took and the response or the result that you got. Um, if you don't have any other format, use that and you should be good. 
I also just wanted to touch in closing just on the impacts of COVID-19 because I guess uh, it has changed the way that lots of industries operate and it has certainly changed the way that companies recruit for vacancies as well. And while COVID-19 hopefully won't last forever, um, I actually think a lot of these changes will stay in place. So we've seen a lot more vacancies in industries like health and community services, transport, call centres, all those industries that are very busy, makes sense that there's more vacancies there. So try and keep an eye out for vacancies in, in those types of industries. We've seen an increased use of technology around video applications and video interviews in particular. Um, so just be prepared for those. We've seen less face-to-face -face interaction and I've seen absolutely no assessment centres and group interviews lately. And I guess that's simply because um, we've got restrictions around who can and can't um, be in the same place at the same time. Um, we've seen an increase in working from home, uh, which I guess is part of why um, technology is really good as well, because we need to be able to keep in touch with people and um, if you're comfortable with a video interview, you're going to be comfortable talking to someone on a Zoom call when you work there. And I guess in general, it's just streamlined the recruitment processes in general. So just in terms of some practical tips that you can actually take away and go and implement right now. Um, number one, tidy up those social media profiles. If there is anything that could paint a bad picture of you, remove it or hide it. Um, and remember, it's not just Facebook either. Um, a lot of businesses will do a Google search. They might go into Bing or other search engines as well. But just about any social media platform that you have, either make it private or tidy it up. Um, adjust your resume to be more enticing to employers. So remember, the goal is you want to use that resume to land an interview. Um, try and include not only the responsibilities, but your accomplishments and any awards and accolades and stuff as well. As time consuming as it might be, tailor your cover letter to each employer. Let that personality come through and point out why it is that you are right for the job and you know how your values and your knowledge align to that business. Practice answering those interview questions and discussing your transferable skills. And it really is a good idea to talk to your family and friends about if, if you don't know what your transferable skills are or how your skills might apply in the workplace, ask them and they'll tell you. <laughs> they know you better than anyone else um, other than yourself and they'll probably be able to tell you where your strengths are and how you can talk about them. Make sure you find some comfortable outfits that make you feel comfortable so that you're not running late for interviews. Um, reach out to that existing network. So your current employer, your colleagues, your friends and family, let them know that you're graduating, what you've studied and what kind of work you're looking for because you'll never know what sort of doors that will open and apply for everything, everything that you're interested in. If you don't apply, <laughs> you won't be considered at all. It's as simple as that. So it can be frustrating. It can be really time consuming, um, but you will get there in the end. And as I said earlier, research does, does tell us that in Australia, graduates secure work within four months of graduation. Um, in the scheme of things, that's like the difference of now to Christmas. Christmas is actually four months from today and Christmas is going <laughs> to creep up on us like you wouldn't believe. So four months might sound like a long time, but it's not. Um, so hang in there. Congratulations again. Um, I'm going to head over to my question panel. Just bear with me while I read a couple of these. <clears throat> So question is, I dropped out and transferred to Griffith. Should I include my previous study in my resume and label it as dropped out? Um, well, it depends on why you dropped out. But yes, the short answer is I think you should include your previous study. Um, perhaps don't include any reasons or anything on your resume, but answer them truthfully if, if you're asked about them in an interview. I've got another one here. I have done an internship that led to a job. In both of them, I did have the same job responsibilities. So do I mention them twice? If not, how do I show my time in months, years doing the internship and the work? 
I'm just trying to think about practically how you would put that in a resume. Um, no, I don't think you need to list the responsibilities twice. I'm assuming that that was for the same employer. So what you could probably do is just put the employer name and the role and responsibilities, but just have two separate date sections. So it shows you know, the first block and then the second time that you were there as well. And perhaps just make a note that it was the same role each time that you were there. Mm. I've got another one. So I have company logos on my CV. Should I remove these? Um, that's a good question. I think that that probably, look, if, if it were me, I would probably like to have the company logo on the resume. Um, it sort of highlights the employers that you've worked for, but I guess there would probably be some recruiters who might think, oh, I don't want any photos or images. So perhaps play it safe and, and don't include them. Um, I think that's, it's probably very much a, a personal choice with that one, depending on who's reading your resume. So if we go by the principle to keep it plain and simple, it's probably best to not have them on there. Um, all right, so how do you respond to the question, what are your weaknesses? <laughs> well, that's never easy. Um, I guess that's one of those things that you need to think about before the interview. So have a chat with your family and friends about um, what they might think your weaknesses are. Uh, to me, I say yes too much and I'm open about that. <laughs> um, this might not be the best example for a graduate, but to give you a little bit of context. So um, sometimes I work with clients and I say yes to everything they need and I overcommit myself, which means I work too many hours and I get tired and I get stressed. Um, I guess if, if I asked that question of someone and they told me, the answer that I just gave, I would probably think that they've got good self-awareness, at least they actually recognise that it's a weakness. Um, what I would recommend is rather than saying I don't have any weaknesses, think of something rather than nothing. Um, if you say that you don't have any weaknesses, well, it's like saying you're perfect when you don't have any experience and you know <laughs> that might not be be the way that you want to portray yourself so I wouldn't feel bad about talking about weaknesses um I definitely think it's better to have something rather than nothing to say with that one sorry I'm I'm just reading reading other questions here so that I can answer these with keeping your resume to two pages how do you condense past employment I've been in the workforce for 18 years so my comment about um, two pages was more towards graduates who haven't got any experience. If you've been in the workplace and you've got plenty of roles that are relevant to what you're applying for, absolutely include them. Um, don't use the two page rule. But if, if you're a graduate who's, you know, done part time and casual work here and there just while you've been studying, I, I would keep it to two pages. Um, if you've had time away from employment, so parental duties or time off between jobs, should you account for this on your resume? Um, yes. So when I look at applications and I see a resume that's got a gap in it, I assume that the person hasn't been employed. Could be for any reason. They might have gone overseas on holidays, you know, long term. They might have been on parental leave, they might have not had a job, they might have been um, going through some health issues, whatever it is. But I think um, the person who's reading your resume will always wonder why there's that gap. So if you can just put a couple of words in to say what it was that happened, you know, without going into a, a lot of detail, depending on what your circumstances are, um, I, I think it is it is best to sort of just put those dates and a little note that it, it was parental leave or it was overseas travel or whatever it was, personal time, um, personal leave, you know, that, that type of stuff. The less, um, the less guessing the person has to do, the better. A question regarding interviews. When the interview panel asks, do you have any questions for us? What are some good slash smart questions that would help? Um, that's a good question too. <laughs> um, I think it's always good to 
as I said earlier, familiarise yourself with the job. And if you've got any questions, ask them. So that might be, uh, what are the work hours? What can I do to better my application so that I would be suited to the business? Um, ask about location and is is there any travel? You know, ask ask basic things like that. I don't think you need a list of five questions or anything, but if there is anything that you're literally not sure about with the job or the company, um, ask it. Um, we've just got a few others here. I never understood the question, why do you want to work for us? How do I answer that? I'm clearly interested if I've applied for the job. Um, well, that's right. I guess if you've applied for the job, you are clearly interested. But what the employer is trying to do is work out why they should hire you over the other, you know, five or ten people that they've interviewed. And that's where you need to be able to talk about those transferable skills and any um, industry knowledge or anything that you can bring along. Um, I guess it's it's their way of asking you, why should we hire you over these other five graduates who have got, you know, minimal experience and the same qualifications as you? It's about letting that personality come through so that um, I guess they can make an informed decision. Last question. In the real world, are there many, oh, hang on, my screen's moving on me. In the real world, are there many jobs for an international student? I have seen many companies have specific visa conditions. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this. The short answer is yes, there are job opportunities for international students. I guess um, what complicates things sometimes for employers is visa conditions and the fact that visas don't last forever. So you'll often find that for international students, the employer will ask about, um, do you intend to apply for residency or anything like that? Um, be honest, you know, some employ, I, I've seen in engineering in particular, I've seen um, students be sponsored. I've seen them on fixed term engagements for the period of their visa um, because they've been upfront about the fact that they're going to go home when their visa expires. Um, I, I've certainly seen those opportunities, I guess. Um, it's probably just a little bit complex at the moment with COVID as well. Um, it's, yeah, there's sort of, with people not really knowing uh, how this is all going to pan out. Um, I feel like I'm not really giving a positive answer to this one, but I, I also am not really sure how it's all going to pan out because of COVID. Well, that was the last question. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you found it useful. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, there's some really interesting insights there. Um, I think I took away from it the, the mantra of think before you post. And I think that's definitely uh, prevalent in this digital world that we're, we're living in. Um, there were also some great tips there, I thought, around researching organisations and how to identify and draw upon those transferable skills. And especially for our recent graduates, really looking at what, um, you know, their study at Griffith is, is able to sort of give them in terms of going out um, into this uh, new world. So look, there were some great questions that we probably didn't get to. I noticed a few there. So we might pass those on to Emma and have a chat with her to see if she might be able to help us respond to those. Uh, and maybe using our, our uh, LinkedIn group might be a good way that we can follow up to those ones that we didn't get to. So I hope that you all really got some uh, great takeaways from this afternoon's session. Uh, we'll be sending an email out with the slides. So just keep an eye on your inbox in the coming days. Uh, in that email, we're also gonna have a short event survey. So we'd really appreciate if you could take some time just to have a look at that survey and, and give us something, um, some feedback so we can continue to improve what we're offering for you and, and for the alumni community. Um, so I hope you join us for some more events in the future. We actually have one on this Thursday and it's around cyber security being a global responsibility. Um, it's another webinar, so we'll be posting the link in the chat section um, of this webinar here, but you can also always see all of our alumni events on our website. So we encourage you to keep checking back to there and identifying areas that um, you can join us and, and um, events you can join us in. And hopefully uh, when the world allows, we'll be able to do some more in-person gatherings. Um, so we're really looking forward to that. If you'd like to know more about what we're doing in alumni engagement or the ways that you can continue to contribute and become involved in the university, um, please get in touch with us at any time. We're social on Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, so just search for Griffith University alumni. 
and um, we hope that their association will continue with us for many years to come. Um, sincerely, I'd like to thank Emma for being here with us today and to all of you for joining us from wherever your location is around the world. I look forward to staying connected with you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or night or whatever time it is in your location. Thank you.